Well, most of us would love to experience something like this. Something like this moment that Isaiah experienced in the temple. Isaiah says that he was in the temple that day and all of a sudden there was a holy smoke and light show. Things began to shake. Light began to pour in. Smoke began to pour in. And there was this overwhelming sense that God was present in that place in an unusual way. It was like... He'd been transported from that temple to heaven or that heaven had been transported into that temple. And Isaiah says that he was terrified, that it was terrible and and terrifying. And even still, most of us would love to have an experience like this. An experience where we can say, obviously and without a doubt, that we had an overwhelming encounter with God that cannot be denied. And if we're honest, we may be wondering why Isaiah had this experience. Why Isaiah? Why not me? Or why Isaiah then and not at other times in his life. What was so special about this particular moment in the temple on that particular day? Was it because God needed to do something in particular with him at that particular time for for that particular people? So, so, So God decided to make it undeniable and encounter Isaiah in the temple in that way so that he wouldn't be able to miss it and so that he would get what God was saying to him and do what God was wanting to do through him. Probably. But I also wonder if it may have also had something to do with Isaiah's attention. In other words, what if Isaiah had this experience not because God orchestrated some undeniable moment, but what if he had this experience because the God who was already there and who was already speaking was able to get through to him because his attention had been sensitized and tenderized in a particular way. Perhaps he'd already been unusually primed for this holy disturbance because of the unusual way that his life had already been disturbed. In fact, that's exactly what he says. We usually just read right over this part, but he's already told us that this kind of thing is what's going on in his life. Do you remember? He said that it all happened in the year that King Uzziah died. In the year that King Uzziah died. When did it happen? We get that. It happened in the year that King Uzziah died. But why did it happen? It happened because it was the year that King Uzziah died. Perhaps that played no small part in why it happened because it was happening in the midst of this moment when King Uzziah died. Because King Uzziah dying was a significant event for these people. It actually signaled the end of an era. The end of an era of relative independence for them. The end of an era of prosperity. Things were getting shook up in the consciousness of these people because of the loss of King Uzziah's life. It wasn't just losing a leader or losing anyone, it was something that was affecting and permeating every moment of all of their lives. And we know what this is like, right? We know what it's like to have some unusual, unexpected, tragic event begin to move in on us and permeate every aspect of our lives. Uzziah's death was permeating every aspect of their lives, and I believe it tenderized Isaiah to experience this moment. It prepared him for it. It prompted him for it. King Uzziah's death was part of their national consciousness, something that they were experiencing, all of them, in both corporate and personal ways. To say that this happened in the year that King Uzziah died is like saying it happened in the year the Challenger exploded. Or saying that it happened in the year that JFK was shot. Or saying this happened in the year when those planes struck the Twin Towers. Or like saying this happened in the years of COVID-19. It's 
pointing us to something unusual that's going on in their lives that's attuning them to things in unnatural ways. Distracting them from things they might normally be tuned into and tuning them into things they might normally be distracted from. You and I are in the midst of a surprising and sustained moment like this where everything in our consciousness is being affected by all that's happening with COVID-19. It's more than affecting the health of our bodies. It's affecting the zeitgeist of our culture, our consciousness. It's, 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 It's causing us to notice things we wouldn't normally notice. There are things happening in our lives and in our careers and our families and in the world that they're interconnected with this in ways we can name and in ways that we can't. I remember that Harvard Business Review article that came out early in the pandemic saying that thing that you're experiencing is grief. It's permeating everything. There's a connection. And the connection couldn't help but remind me of a moment when one of the greatest athletes of all time chose to retire. And no, I'm not talking about Tom Brady. I know better than to do that right now. Still fresh, right? I'm talking about, uh, I'm actually talking about Michael Jordan, and some of you may have been refreshed on this as well if you found yourself watching the docuseries The Last Dance on ESPN or on Netflix, which follows the last championship run of the Chicago Bulls and really gives a picture of Michael Jordan's whole life and career as a part of of all of that. And, And in the midst of that, I was reminded of several moments because I grew up in that 80s and 90s time when this was a part of the zeitgeist of what we were experiencing. But I especially remember being taken off guard by his retirement. Now, he retired three times. I'm talking about the first retirement. And I think many of us were taken off guard by the retirement because he'd, he just won another championship, championship number three. And we were wondering why someone who seemed to be at the height of their athletic powers Someone who was, who was on this incredible run. He hadn't lost one. He'd won three in a row. Why would he retire at this time? Was he retiring because, as he said, he'd accomplished so much. Everything that he'd hoped to accomplish, and it was just time to go after other challenges. Perhaps. Probably. Was he retiring because, as he later said, the attention and the pressure of being one of the most visible people on the planet was just so overwhelming that he needed a break from that. Probably. Was he retiring because (laughs) he had a gambling problem and the uh, NBA needed him to take a a secret year of suspension so he could get his life right and what his gambling problem wouldn't tarnish the legacy of him or the NBA? Maybe. Maybe. Was he retiring because a group of space aliens had captured the Looney Tunes? And they were only going to set them free if they were able to beat them in a basketball game and they needed a ringer. So he needed to take some time off for that. I doubt it. But most of that other stuff probably actually played into his decision. Though comparably, not nearly as much as the thing that most prompted his retirement. And that was his father's death. His father's unexpected and tragic death. It had happened three months before, and the power of that was permeating every aspect of his life. It had overtaken him. This was captured no more perfectly in that moment after he won that third championship, and there were cameras in the locker room, and you see him coming in and falling on the ground with the game ball, and he's just rolling around on the floor in the locker room. I don't know if you've seen this, but every time I saw this before this past year, it always happened as a part of some series without the sound on. So you could see it, and it looked like this powerful moment where he just won this, and of course you knew what was going on in his life, and, 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 and he was really celebrating in that moment, except that in the docuseries for the first time, they turned up the volume on that moment. When they turned up the volume, you experienced it in a way you'd never experienced before, because what you saw and what you heard was one of the most famous people in the world one of the greatest athletes of all time, shaking and sobbing loudly in his grief. Why? Because his father and his father's death was always with him. 
It was always with him. It was there permeating everything else. And in the wake of it, other things didn't seem to matter as much. Everything else seemed different. That may be happening in a way for all of us now. Because you see, it was certainly happening for Isaiah, not just in that corporate consciousness way, but, but similarly to Michael Jordan in a kind of personal way as well. Because Isaiah wasn't just a prophet, he was a royal prophet. So he was in relationship with Isaiah. Many people also believe that Uzziah wasn't just a prophet or a royal prophet who was in relationship with Uzziah, but that he was a family member of Uzziah's. He was in relationship. The consciousness of the nation had certainly been impacted by Uzziah's death, but it had also affected Isaiah in profoundly personal ways as well. Some people in our country will look back on these days that we're living in now as the days of the COVID-19 pandemic and all of the ways that it affected our lives. Others will look back on this year as the year that virus claimed the life of their father, their brother, their sister, their mother, their grandfather, their child. The impact will be more personal. It'll be more acute. And that's what I think is happening with Isaiah here. His consciousness has been impacted by grief in a personal way, and that has opened him up in a way to God and to others and even to himself in a way that was unusual. Notice Isaiah's first response to the holiness of God. Woe to me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and I have seen the Lord God Almighty. It's an incredibly powerful moment that we may be tempted to process in only general ways. But it's also personal. It can be personal for us in the way that it pictures the gospel. In fact, this moment may picture the gospel of Jesus Christ in a way for us that's very helpful because in it what we see is Isaiah recognizing his own guilt. And we may see this moment with Isaiah and realize that we all have this sense of guilt, this sense of fallenness, this sense that we have allowed ourselves to fall short of the glory and holiness of God. And that at some level we all need at one moment, forgiveness, atonement. And 1 John 1 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and clean, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This is the gift of God through Jesus Christ. We're going to be talking about that more during the Lenten season. But even more so, this moment with Isaiah is, is, is personal in a particular way. Did you notice? Did you notice the lips? Isaiah says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. The commissioning of Isaiah in this moment after his cleansing has something to do with something that's going on with his lips. Or perhaps more importantly, his voice. Why? Because it's personal. It'd be like Michael Jordan realizing in a moment like this that he was a man of unclean shoes because we all know it was the shoes, right? If you grew up in the 80s and 90s, you know what I'm talking about. Or it'd be like State Farm reps like Aaron Rodgers or Patrick Mahomes realizing that they were people of unclean arms or minds because it's such a mental game. Or it'd be some visionary leader, perhaps, or strategic leader in this congregation realizing that they were persons of unclean strategy living among people of unclean strategy. Or like Isaiah saying, he realizes he's a man of unclean lips. Living among a people of unclean lips. Isaiah didn't realize in that moment before God that he had an unclean mind. Isaiah didn't realize in that moment before God that he had an unclean spirit. And I think this is because what his realization was about in particular was how he had been stewarding and using his gifts. Isaiah had the God-given gift of communication, of speech, 
He knew how to communicate. He knew how to tune into God's will and God's ways and, and to speak that from his heart to the people. And I think what he may have realized in this moment that he had fallen prey to something that we're all in danger of falling prey to. It's tempting for all of us, you see, to <laughs> take the gifts that God has given us and use them only for us. Use them only to make much of us instead of making much of God. To take these gifts and say, these gifts that I have are for me and my family and, and my loved ones and, and my business or my professional life and my wealth and my future and my legacy. It's all about me. Isaiah had achieved quite a bit of success using his gift of speech. A royal counselor and prophet for the king, which is something that was fraught with temptation. Because you, you want this to benefit you and you don't want this to be taken away from you, right? So was it tempting for Isaiah, do you think, in this position to only say things with his gift that he knew others wanted him to say and to not say anything that they didn't? Absolutely. It would have been much easier that way, but God hadn't called him and equipped him and positioned him in life for something that was easy, but for something that was good. And that sometimes can mean trouble. Good trouble, but trouble. You know, we don't often, when we read this passage, read beyond verse 8. But if you did, what you'd see is that once Isaiah's soul and his lips had experienced cleansing, in the aftermath of that, he heard God calling him to do something that was going to be quite uncomfortable for him and for God's people. He was calling him to wake them up. To use his voice, his gift of speech, to say things that they might not be willing to hear. Things that they didn't want to hear. Things that, when they heard them, would make them uncomfortable and Isaiah's life uneasy. But Isaiah needed to do this. He needed to do and be who God was calling him to do and be all along. To do good things, but not easy things. Things he wasn't able or willing to hear until the year that King Uzziah died. I wonder how these pandemic years are affecting you. I wonder how these pandemic years are tenderizing you and perhaps pricking and prodding at your attention and your prayer life and your consciousness in new ways. I wonder if in addition to wrestling with difficult things, all the difficult things we're dealing with, I wonder if these times might also be marked by an increased ability to give your attention to God and to self and to others. And I wonder what God is trying to say to you and to do with you now. During one of the most difficult years of Isaiah's life, Isaiah had an experience that changed his life forever. And I wonder if you or I might too. During one of the most difficult years in Isaiah's life, Isaiah had an experience with God that changed his life forever, causing him to reevaluate not only his personal commitment to God, but to also recalibrate how he was using his God-given gifts in this world and in his life. And all of this prompted Isaiah to recommit his life and his gifts to God. I wonder what it is that God is calling you to do or to be right now. I find it interesting if you look closely at this passage of Scripture that Isaiah didn't hear God's voice until after he'd given his life and his gifts back to God. What is it that you hear God saying to you right now and how will you respond to it? Or, do you hear God saying something to you right now? And if not, 
how is it that you might need to respond to that? Consider this as we continue to worship and as we sing our hymn of response. <laughs>